Okay, mic check. Can you hear me like this? All right, perfect. Are the camera also? Where is the? Like this? Okay, we have contact. Okay. Yeah, I Okay, perfect. So, uh, have you been back uh, to Japan? Like, did you go back to Japan during the pandemic? Um, once, yeah, uh, last, this autumn, I uh -huh. went to the uh, Japan attended the conference, but that, that's all. Yeah, only once. Yeah, yeah. And uh, but I I I am here uh, during pandemic, so <laughs> I I'm here for almost two years now. Mm -hmm. So I'm not. I think I, it's okay. Yeah. Oh yeah, so, that's one. Still two years. Maybe I'm here for five years and I cannot go back to <laughs> for that duration. It is so sad, but it's just too bad. Yeah, it's not too bad. Not yeah, too bad. yeah, I um. I was like during the pandemic skateboarding with Eric. Like, remember Eric Fetigura? He was uh, yeah. also at the at the Akita meeting, mm -hmm. and this was like at the height of the pandemic. And we were like, "Yeah, like we should figure out a way to go to Japan." Yeah. And so, like, turned out it was more difficult than we <laughs> thought. <laughs> but uh, we did have this like momentary idea of uh, you know. What if? So in Japan, yeah, yeah, yeah. I haven't gotten tickets yet, um, but absolutely. And I am planning to also, you know, I don't think I can bring my whole family, but I think I'll bring my wife. And she's never been to Japan. Like, I'll uh, show her where I grew up. It's yeah, going to be yeah, awesome. Yeah. yeah. Uh, sorry, where did you stay and where did you grow up? So I grew up in Saitama-ken. Saitama, yeah. yeah. Okay. So it's close to Tokyo. Yeah. yeah. In fact, I was like right on the border. So it was like Wakoshi. Okay. Yeah, like okay. like on Tobu Tojo Sen. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> Tobu Tojo Sen. <laughs> I didn't say this word for a long time. <laughs> yes. It's my, it's my, uh, it's like when I, Feel a little sad and just pull up pictures of Tobu Tojo Sam. Okay. Makes me feel <laughs> okay. okay. All right. Okay, so it's time. So let's start today's seminar. Today, uh, today's uh, speaker is uh, Constantine Batis, Professor Constantine Batis from the Caltech in the United States. And he took his PhD uh, in the Caltech and he worked in NASA and me. And from uh, since 2019, he is a professor in the college. So 
he's a very famous prof uh, professor in the field of the planetary science. Uh, when I was a master student, <laughs> uh, uh, we, uh, the paper about the planet nine was archived. So at that time, uh, many people in my university discussed about the planet nine. Yeah, it was so exciting uh, time. So it is very, I'm very happy we can invite him to our institute and to our seminar. And he will talk about the formation of rocky planets today. Yeah. So he will talk about the update about the planet. All right. Okay. <laughs> thank you very much, Sho. And thank you all for the invitation. Um, I was, I was frankly freaked out a little bit by things falling from the sky um like not used to this uh in la but i uh this is really beautiful and the other thing that i was like not expected is you know i've i um uh, i've always wanted to know what it's like to to be a backstreet boy and i didn't expect that during the seminar i'm gonna have the uh the opportunity to you know have the the backstreet boy you know set up with the with the mic exactly <laughs> yeah yeah um okay so the goal of the talk I want to give today really is to to attack a problem that I've uh, I've been working on together with my partner in crime Morby uh, in Nice, and it is the question of how do you form the most abundant type of planet throughout the galaxy, the rocky super Earth. So I think it's it comes as sort of no surprise, and at this point, it's old news that photometric and spectroscopic surveys have discovered over the last two and a half decades uh, these types of objects in extraordinary abundance right something like 50 maybe more percent of the stars within the galaxy are encircled by uh, planets that are short period and subjovian the thing that uh, i think is a little bit more new and that i find pretty staggering is that even though the overall diversity of the sample of planets is pretty remarkable. Um, if you focus on each system, like kind of one system at a time, and examine the planetary planets that encircle each specific star, there's a remarkable degree of uniformity among them. So there's this kind of weird dichotomy of simultaneously there being a great uh you know yeah. range in overall densities that these planets wow. exhibit and then, then if you go to the same star it looks like the star decides on the kind of planet factory and its protoplanetary disk it says now churn out the same thing over and over again okay so that's that kind of uniformity and diversity dichotomy is point one the other uh, thing that has come into sharper focus over the last you know few years is the radius distribution. So this is a nice plot from a paper by Eric Pettigura, where you see the distribution of planetary radii as a function of their orbital period. And I think you don't have to be kind of a master statistician to see that there's two blobs. It also helps that there's two blobs drawn on the uh, plot to kind of really guide your eye, but it really is statistically significant that planets come in two preferred sizes. One at sort of 1.3 or so uh, Earth radii and another about a factor of two larger than that. And this has been um, predicted, in fact, by the theory of photo evaporation. Because after all, in planet formation, like planet formation has uh, traditionally been a game of retrodiction, right? You have some theory, then you find something new, you realize your theory is crap, and you kind of make a new theory until you realize that theory is crap too, because you found something yet, you know, different. I mean, conversely, this bimodal dispersion of planetary radii was predicted in the early 2000s because and the idea was that all of these super earth type objects right these objects that are a few times more massive than our own planet form in the protoplanetary disk they capture hydrogen and helium but if the hydrogen helium ratio that they capture is above three percent then they evaporate down to about 3% by mass. If it's below, then it evaporates down to a bare rocky core. And the reason that 3% is a special number is because that's where the evaporation kind of time scale gets maximized. Okay? So this is pretty robust. And so if you interpret this population as bare kind of atmosphere-free objects, and these guys are the 
cores plus a hydrogen helium atmosphere, then this tells you quite a bit about the composition. And the remarkable thing is the composition is rocky. Okay, it, these things fall onto the rocky kind of mass diagram. So they are really expanded versions of the Earth. They are not miniaturized versions of Uranus and Neptune. So those are kind of the three th uh, pieces of uh, key information that is important to keep in mind is that uh, the mass exceeds the Earth by a factor of a few. These planets are silicate rich. And for some reason, if you go around a sing single star, they're uniform. And finally, of course, we cannot forget right, that the solar system also exists. So whatever story we create for the formation of these guys has to also link somehow to the formation of the terrestrial planets. Because after all, if these are overgrown terrestrial planets, then whatever you know, unified theory we create should explain the terrestrial planets too. So let me um, begin by reviewing what the current paradigm is. I'll argue that this is not the way you make the, uh, the super Earths, but the current paradigm is that these planets are dominantly created by a process called pebble accretion. And the story behind pebble accretion is that you form you know, a small thing, this can be a planetesimal, and you can build uh, beyond the planetesimal stage by colliding more planetesimals together, right? which sounds like the right thing to do. But in fact, under favorable con uh, conditions, under certain conditions, it is better to just continue to accrete dust from the protoplanetary disk. And the reason, it seems counterintuitive because, you know, like, I don't know that much, but I know that within one asteroid, there's lots and lots of dust grains, right? So it seems kind of silly to be capturing one dust grain at a time. But the way that this model, this pebble accretion paradigm can win is by having a huge accretion cross-section, right? So rather than kind of, you know, shooting two tiny asteroids at one another, it can capture dust over a much larger uh, gravitational radius. So that's why uh, it's been... Uh, favored in the last decade as the mode of accretion to build large planets. Now, the uh, kind of qualification here is that it works super well under the right conditions. And what I mean by that is if all the dust in your disk solid uh, the, settles to a thin layer, okay, and you can accrete through a two-dimensional version of this paradigm, which is shown here, then indeed, it's great. It's like you know, vacuuming the floor when all the uh, dust has already settled. The, uh, if the dust, however, does not settle to a thin layer, then you're in the 3D version of this uh, story and it's completely un inefficient. And well, how do you decide if, uh, which one you're in? And the answer is it depends on the Stokes number. In fact, the Stokes number is like the most important unconstrained parameter in planet formation theory, okay? The Stokes number is physically, it gives you the fraction of the orbit that, you, that a dust grade needs to travel to re-equilibrate with the gas. So if you give it kind of a random velocity within the disk, after some time, it will recouple with the background flow just through aerodynamic drag. And that dimensionless number of radians is the Stokes number. If you look at the kind of, formula for the Stokes number, there's absolutely nothing magical about it. It's just the density of the grain divided by the density of the gas uh, times the kind of sound crossing time times the orbital frequency. So in a sense, there's nothing kind of unusual. There's no dark matter or there's not even magnetic fields. Uh, but the issue is that each one of these things appear to be individually difficult to constrain. So a relatively common you know, thing to do in the literature is to just choose a Stokes number, like I would consider a constant Stokes number of three times 10 to the minus three, and then build your planet formation theory on top of that assumption. Okay, and you can do perhaps, uh, you know, you can inform it a little bit by looking at meteorites. This is a picture of a meteorite. Um, where there's little inclusions that are about a millimeter across. Um, but really, the more satisfying thing to would be to deduce a theory that self-consistently gives you the Stokes number provided a model for the disk. After all, right, in reality, 
right? Reality does not decouple or divorce the dust that you build within a protoplanetary disk from the disk model itself. So that's the first thing that I want to uh, cover in today's talk is the question of how do, like, what does the dust gas coupling look like in the protoplanetary disk? This is a paper from earlier this year. And um, you may have already noticed this, but I'm very unsophisticated. Okay. So like I can't do sophisticated 3D, like hydro radiative, blah, blah, blah. Okay. But I can draw a triangle using Keynote. Okay. That's going to be my model for the disc. Okay. It's going to be, there's going to be a star. There's going to be some gas. And the first statement that I'm going to make is to ask, what is the job of the disc? And the job of the disc is to accrete onto its host star. I'm going to go away in uh, about 3 million years. So the accretion rate of the disc is definitionally is related to the radial velocity at which the gas sinks upon the star and the disc surface density. Okay. Why is there radial velocity to the gas, right? If you take a particle and just put it into a two body orbit, it won't circular two, two body orbit. It won't have radial velocity. And in the viscous uh, accretion paradigm, the reason that you have radial velocity is because the disk is turbulent and turbulence on a large scale is viscosity. So the disk spreads, okay? It's kind of like in a 1D sense, you can say, if I put my star here and decide that this is going to be the domain where I have my disk and take a bunch of honey and dump it onto the table. In fact, this would be a fun experiment to do right now, okay? If anybody has honey and chocolate, no? Okay. Uh, so, you know, then it'll spread viscously and most of it will accrete upon uh, the star. A little bit will move out. So this VR is intimately tied to the viscosity of the disk. Now, what is the viscosity of the disk? Well, that comes from turbulence and the conventional way to parameterize disk viscosity is through the so-called Shakura Sunayev pre alpha prescription. I like this prescription more than Perhaps I should, because I only realized this in grad school, but Shakura took me to Disneyland when I was like 10 in Tokyo, and it was awesome. Um, I had no idea that he was into uh, all this astrophysics, but, uh, but he was a nice guy. Anyway, uh, the standard kind of way to do this is to say that the viscosity um, is, of course, a turbulent velocity scale times a turbulent length scale. And the, those are related to the speed of sound and the scale height of the disk. Uh, and then you know, with a dimensionless factor less than unity called alpha. And finally, okay, you can invoke two things that are pretty well set in stone, the ideal gas law, as well as hydrostatic balance to then relate the viscosity to temperature okay, within the disk. So said the word temperature. Now I have to kind of defend it, right? Where does disk temperature come from? Well, one portion of it comes indeed from the fact that the star is irradiating the disk. But for accretion rates greater or the equal to the nominal value of 10 to the minus 8 solar masses per year, in fact, a different process dominates, which is the process of the disk heating itself, right? This is turbulent and the turbulence, right, cascades down Right? So that process will create its own mechanical heating within the disk, and that, disk, that heating will escape the surface of the disk just through uh, black body radiation. So, so far, this is just kind of conventional active disk theory. It's well known that you can relate the temperature of the disk to the M dot of the disk, if the disk heats itself, because they are the same process. Right? It's that release of gravitational energy. So because of this, you can express the temperature as a function of M dot, as well as other parameters uh, raised to the one fifth power. Okay? And you can sort of, with this, project uh, contours of temperature everywhere within the disk on a M dot, right, versus the disk alpha uh, plane at every orbital radius. Remember that M dot of the disk is a proxy for time. The disk will accrete a lot in the beginning, and then as it loses mass, it will go down. So you can think of, you know, for a given level of turbulence within the disk, it'll kind of travel 
vertically uh, on each one of these plots. Okay, so so far this is kind of relatively common stuff that you can look up in the book by Phil Armitage. The key point I want to say here is that if you know the temperature all everywhere, you also know the scale height and the speed of sound. And so it means you know the viscosity everywhere. And if you know the viscosity everywhere, you know how turbulent the disk is everywhere. And how if you know how turbulent the disk is everywhere, you have a very nice estimate for the turbulent velocity scale. Right? It's just square root of alpha times the speed of sound. That's definitionally what it is in the alpha uh, prescription. Okay. So, okay, why do you care? Well, you care because if you have turbulent gas, you're going to create a dispersion of velocities within the dust as well. In fact, it's relatively straightforward to show, man, I missed this last time. I should have fixed the slides, but I didn't. There should be a two here on VTurb. VTurb should be squared. I apologize for that. But uh, the velocity, the square of the velocity dispersion of the dust um, ratioed by the square of the turbulent velocity of the gas is given to you by the Stokes number. You know, the way to think about it is like, if I take, I don't know, if I light up, I mean, this is Europe, so I don't know if like what the smoking laws are inside, but if like I light, light up a cigarette, right, and start smoking here, that's going to be very fine grains. And if I go like this, right, I'll create turbulence within the cigarette smoke, and it'll basically perfectly follow right, the turbulent flow. And the grains themselves will be perfectly confined to the background turbulent flow of the gas, and their collisions among themselves will be negligible because their Stokes number is so low. But if I then start growing my cigarette smoke grains, and they start decoupling away from the gas, then they can start colliding among themselves because they kind of develop their own velocity dispersion. Okay, well, why does it matter? It matters because the way you stop growth is to develop a velocity dispersion so large that collisions among grains become destructive. Okay, and that's the last piece of this model. And this has been measured um, in the lab. And the basic story there is depending on the composition of your grain, right? The velocity that leads to fragmentation is either one or 10 meters per second. If it's icy grains like we have outside, you can throw them at one another at up to 10 meters per second, and they'll stick pretty well. Okay, if it's rocky kind of fractal grains that have been uh, sublimated out of the gas, this fragmentation velocity scale is smaller by an order of magnitude. So if we put all this together, remember we've got this from the lab and we have this from the disk model, we can actually just derive and write down a simple self-consistent equation for the Stokes number. And unfortunately, the zoom like box is blocking this, but I promise you that behind this box that says I, ah, uh, that that will require that will re require. See, like I don't know why, I'm, but on my computer, um, the mouse disappears when I go on to zoom. But I just, what I want you guys to do is use the power of your imagination to imagine that there's a power one fifth, okay, outside of the this bracket. Okay, I promise you it's there. So this is what the, you know, self-consistent, oh my, uh, yeah, this is what the self-consistent model um, tells you. Okay? So you don't have to assume uh, a number. If you choose a disk model, that disk model dictates what the dust will do inside of it. So what is it, how does it translate to size? Well, if you take our equation that we've derived and relate it back to the definition of the Stokes number that I showed you, then you can solve for particle radius. And it tells you that in the outer disk where water ice can form, you have few centimeter ice grains. In fact, it's snowing outside right now with sort of two centimeter ice grains, right? Inside, however, the ice line, because the fragmentation velocity is low, you have millimeter or less, okay? In fact, not too different from what we saw inside that meteorite, okay? So in the inner disk, you have really, really fine grains. And fine grains means small Stokes number. 
So when we translate this back to the problems of dust settling, what this tells us is that in the inner disk, the dust is very well mixed vertically. Okay, And so pebble accretion, unfortunately, in the inner disk is completely ineffective. And com by completely ineffective, what I mean is that you don't have this picture, right, where grain comes in nicely and gets captured in a 2D sense. You have a planet flying through a very tall you know, column where the dust is, is very well distributed vertically and, you know, accreting very little. Uh, it's kind of like trying to vacuum your your house by you know first distributing all the dust vertically and then running around with the vacuum hoping to you know capture some of the dust grains. There's also a different analogy, which is a little bit more fun, uh, but I'll uh, I won't say what it is. Okay, uh, now um, all of this stuff is not just uh, you know kind of theoretical, you know qualitative. Um, you know, qualitative, qualitative speculation. If you go to, you know, sort of state of the art numerical simulations of solar system or planetary system formation, you actually see this unfolding, right? In the work of Isidoro et al., which starts out with a smooth distribution of rocky and icy embryos within the disk, and they grow by both pebble accretion and planetesimal collisions. What you get to see is that in the outer disk, the planets grow really fast. And then once they grow up massive, they migrate in through you know, nebular tides. And so the good prediction, like a very well-defined prediction of this entire story is that the super Earths should be water rich because they grow in the outer disk, but they're not. Okay, so I think, I think this is not right. I mean, I think this is absolutely how you grow the cores of the giant planets in the outer disk. Like, I'm no, uh, I'm like a big supporter of pebble accretion beyond 3AU. And I think that inside of 3AU does not work. So, you know, if super Earths cannot form by pebble accretion, then how do they form? And this is squarely in the category of like, you know, if two people tell you they're Jesus, one of them is wrong, right? And there's only two ways to grow a planet. One is to capture dust. The other way is to collide planetesimals together uh, with one another. But the reason the planetesimal story was abandoned in the first place is because if you distribute your planetesimals smoothly, then A, it takes forever, right? Just the time scale of accretion is really long. You can work this out analytically. And also the isolation mass is really small. Okay, you can also work that out analytically. So, so you know, if we're going to form the, planet, uh, the objects by planetesimal accretion, then something in our conventional understanding of the distribution of solids within the disk must be wrong. And here's what we think it is, okay? And for this, you have to go back to the very beginning of the question of how does the disk form? Now, when I was learning planet formation, I'm in grad school or whatever, right? I was told that the star starts out as a big blob of hydrogen and helium. And then once it collapses, like once you trigger a gravitational collapse, then every shell will fall in conserving its specific angular momentum because... You know, that's what you do in absence of torques, but it's totally wrong, right? Like that's not, uh, that, that would be true in absence of torques and critically that'd be true in absence of magnetic fields. But it's a, actually a self-consistent story because the reason, you know, people think you get consistent rotation in the, in the cores and uh, kind of star forming cores anyway is in part due to the partial ionization of the blobs of hydrogen so that you know, and then the field pierces them you get a pretty you know good axis of symmetry and so in modern calculations of disk formation you don't collapse each shell to its own orbital radius uh, given by specific angular momentum instead you kind of collapse everything really close to the star. And the reason is that magnetohydrodynamics, like MHD, uh, in the ideal regime, 
really, really likes to kill differential rotation, right? That's what Omega effect really is good at doing. So when you have a cloud collapsing and it's pierced by magnetic fields and there's uh, sufficient ionization, you will very effectively transport angular momentum outwards. Okay? So the kind of emerging picture of star formation and disk formation is not one where you disk, you kind of take individual blobs and land them one at a time uh, from the inside out. You have a centrifugal radius, which is a fraction of an AU for about half of a million years, and all the matter falls close to the star. In fact, the reason it doesn't all fall onto the star is because only because of ambipolar diffusion. This is true. If you don't consider on Yes. So later on in the disk, of course, you right as as the disk kind of as the system grows, absolutely, you do also have infall later on. But I'm talking here about the first, yeah, point four point point three million years, right? You're just dumping material really uh, in the. Um, again, remember, I'm I'm just I'm just good at drawing triangles, right? And then I'd have to, yeah. No, you're absolutely right. And to be clear, this picture, right, you know it's it's incomplete at some sense because with this picture where all of the material falls within the first AU or something like that and then viscously spreads, right? Sure, you can build a disk that's 10, 20 AU, but you're not going to build a disk that's 200 AU. And we know such objects exist. So those require also infall that's far further away. So absolutely, uh, that happens, but that happens later. Okay, so if this is the case, and this is uh, some work that uh, we did that Morby led uh, earlier, um, I guess this year, then at first, the disk is a decretion disk rather than an accretion disk. If you're sitting somewhere far away, right, you see an outflow coming away from the star. And I don't know that much, but I know that if you embed vapor within an outflow, it's going to flow out, okay? Uh, conversely, if you turn this vapor into you know, solid grains, um, <clears throat> then because the disc, oh, it's like, it's like the coffee machine has strong opinions about this. It, it's, I'm not really sure what it's trying to tell me, but it's just like, Either it's agreeing or disagreeing with me strongly. It's, but it's not it doesn't. It's not neutral. Uh, okay. So once you go out beyond the kind of sublimation line of any given species, you form grains, and because the disc is subcaplarian due to its pressure support, the grains drift in. Right. Remember, the gas is orbiting at like ninety nine point five percent of the Keplerian velocity, not a hundred percent. So the grains feel a headwind and drift in. And this leads to accumulation of uh, material at a sublimation line. For rock, right, this happens to be in the early disk at about 1 AU. And this is, uh, if you're interested in the details of this a little bit more, we actually figured this out first uh, with Morby back in 2020, uh, well, really 2019, so like 6,000 years ago before, uh, you know, before the world ended. And, uh, you know, you, you can demonstrate that this process actually leads to, in a, in a decretion disk, there exists a equilibrium, a stable equilibrium for a given Stokes number where dust will get kind of globally trapped. But to go back to what I was saying, right, in this scenario, right, and the scenario really just says we have uh, material, disk material that's landing in uh, close to the star. It's decreting and then turning into grains when the grains sublimate. What you tend to do is you tend to accumulate material at the sublimation lines. But for the rock, you accumulated it at the rock sublimation line. For the ice, you accumulated at ice sublimation line. And so you move away from the usual picture of smoothly distributed solids throughout the disk in favor of a ringed uh, protoplanetary nebula. And this is a figure from uh, the, this Morby et al. paper where you see kind of formation of planetesimals happening um, in, a, in a narrow uh, ring through gravitational collapse at about 1 AU. 
So in this 2022 paper, we tried very well, uh, and really all credit here goes to Morbi. It's like Morbi plus Epsilon, uh, right? Um, so Morbi uh, tried very well to reproduce uh, the solar system itself. But one of the things we noticed is that if you don't actively try to fine tune the model to reproduce the solar system itself, then the amount of material that you can uh, accumulate in your rock ring at one AU can be tens of earth masses readily. And it ultimately depends on your kind of minimum turbulence that you allow within the disk. So if you have your minimum turbulence be alpha of 10 to the minus four, as is beginning to be supported by ALMA observations, then for solar metallicity, right, your rock ring can acquire indeed many tens of earth masses of material. So this leads us to the uh, naive question. If the disk, if the solids within the disk are you know, concentrated into rings, can the rock ring uh, generate super earths? And like in spirit of Christmas, the rock ring sounds like some kind of an ice skating ring where like they play rock music, uh, which is you know, which is another business idea I have. Any any investors in? No? Uh, okay. Uh, all right. So uh, this is, why am I showing you this? I'm showing you this. This is because it's going to be published uh, very soon. Oh, and this is like, if you are the referee and, I, and you don't see your referee work being acknowledged in this paper, it's because they made us remove it. Okay. That's, that's the reason I'm showing it. Um, back to science um so if you are now within a 20 earth mass ring of silicates at 1 au right you can pretty quickly even without doing uh simulation too many simulations get an estimate for how growth will unfold this is because the mass accretion rate if you're colliding planetesimals is intimately rate intimately related to the rate of planetesimals collisions right so the n sigma v calculation for planetesimal collisions gives you also the m dot okay and this is a well known kind of formula uh, dating back decades it depends in part on the safronov number which is the uh, ratio of the escape velocity to the planetesimal velocity dispersion squared. And if we assume that uh, this is on the order of a few, okay, and this theta then becomes on the order of 10, this is an assumption that we make for now, but it is uh, kind of justified with numerical simulations momentarily, then this equation tells you that within the ro rock ring, okay, you grow from a planetesimal to an Earth-like object in about 0.1 million years. Okay, so that's pretty promising. And the other thing that's interesting about this uh, mode of growth is that there exists a very natural growth termination process. And that termination process is migration. So remember that in a protoplanetary disk, orbital migration, its speed scales with the planetary mass. It's because the reason migration exists in the first place is that the planet is raising wakes within the disk that then gravitationally back react upon the planet, right? So if the migration you know, is a process that's going to take you out of this feeding zone of the uh, solid material, then it makes sense that you will stop growing when your mass doubling time will become roughly equal to the migration time. So you grow, grow, grow until migration takes you out and then you're off to kind of go close to the, the star and then the next planet grows. So this is a, perhaps an oversimplified picture that I'm presenting to you for now, but the key reason why I'm giving you this relationship is that this is a natural way to create uniformity within the the planet formation paradigm right you again grow until migration takes you out okay. so let's now move on to a bit of a numerical experiment so this is a numerical experiment uh showing you essentially everything i just said 
the rocky planetesimals appear in a ring of spanning about 0.8 to 1.2 AU over a period of about 100,000 uh, years. And in that period, right, self-consistently, you see the emergence of a number of cores, which are quite self-similar in mass. In fact, by this point, right, by about a couple hundred thousand years into the simulation, these objects are already many Earth masses. And having kind of eaten up the disk, right, they are kind of done with their growth phase. So for the rest of the time, okay, uh, the, the story is merely that of their orbital migration inward until they kind of settle close to the inner disk edge where they are now observed by uh, photometric and spectroscopic surveys. And importantly, in this simulation, we don't like, you know, we're not anti-pebble accretion activists, Morby and I, right? We're just, uh, with the, those processes are modeled self-consistently in the calculation, but as it turns out, they're just kind of not important, right? You lead to sort of, you know, a 10, 20%, um, you know, 10, 20% uh, growth throughout the whole thing. And the uh, vast majority of the paradigm is uh, accomplished through just regular old planetesimal formation. So this is, again, one simulation. You can read off the masses here, and you can also compute their RMS and divide them by the mean mass, and you get about half. Okay, which is what is observed within the data. No. So you 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 form them in the ring, right? Then they come out, and well, this is all within the first point one point two million years, and like that process together with isolation just eats up the ring pretty rapidly then the whole thing right that whole system migrates inward and once it reaches the inner disk where the type 1 torque reverses and they kind of park here then the whole thing just you know is in a compact configuration so you um you, you lose them to migration, kind of, you lose all of them, so to speak, to migration inward, uh, where, they're, uh, where they uh, stabilize and they're done. Now, um, we've done, you know, I'm not a, uh, I'm not a population synthesis person, but we've done a very simple uh, version of population synthesis where we just kind of varied the total ring mass equivalently. That's kind of equivalent to saying we varied the, um, you know, nebula turbulence and you can well in this rather straightforward manner demonstrate that indeed you can recreate by saying that different disks have different alphas you create a broad diversity of planetary bodies but each system will produce a rather self-similar you know self-similar population of planets and as you crank up the disk mass both the number of planets will go up and their mean mass will go up. Okay. So I think, right, much work remains to be done, of course, but I think this is a relatively promising avenue towards explaining the fact that these planets, right, are few Earth masses, they're silicate rich because they form in the uh, you know, silicate ring, they're self-similar, they're uniform. And importantly, this story very naturally connects to the architecture of the solar system itself, right? Because the solar system itself, the terrestrial planets of you know, one of which we're standing on, we are pretty certain formed in a ring, okay? The way you get small Mars and Mercury is by concentrating the material um, locally. So uh, this is course uh you know a perpetual work in progress but uh i hope to to have you know presented a kind of a platform for what we're we're thinking about now i know it's eleven twenty six. do we have a little bit more time to talk for a little bit more okay yeah okay good because uh like i looked up that, so this is a picture of a super earth uh, that i downloaded from the internet okay 
So it's what, exactly what it looks like. But I also looked up another picture of a super earth that I also downloaded from the internet that looks like this, uh, which is sort of another problem that I've been uh, really uh, heavily involved in. So I'll give you guys just a brief update on where things stand with the solar systems kind of five earth mass object. And oftentimes people will ask me, like, how's it going with the observational search for planet nine? You know, and uh, I have a good answer. It's going horribly, right? Because we haven't found it, um, right? And it's, it's a weird search because you're looking for one thing, right? And when you're looking for one thing, as long as you're looking, it's going horribly because you, you're at zero. But then when you find it, it's one, and then your search is over. So anyway, um, the in the last, you know, five or six years, what I've realized is, is how, you know, challenging observing can be. But at the same time, you know, some of the kind of on the theoretical front, uh, some of the predictions that the Planet Nine model has made uh, have really, you know, come into sharper focus. And I would say, I'll go as far as saying, uh, been, you know, vindicated by the data. So let me remind you where this story started. It started back in 2015, 2016, where inspired by the work of Trujillo and Shepard, we noticed that if you go into the outermost regions of the Kuiper Belt and concentrate on the longest period objects, then there is a, you know, they all kind of are tilted by a common angle, right? About 20 degrees with respect to the ecliptic plane. And they all point into the same direction, right? And we thought that this was kind of a big deal, right? But at the time, the kind of cumulative tally of, uh, of objects was six. Now, the data set has since more than tripled. So this is what the uh, distribution of orbits in the outer solar system looks like now. So again, you can sort of by eye see that there is a uh, the cluster that we saw before uh, is now pointing down. There's also some objects that are that don't fall into the cluster. And this inset uh, shows the projection of the angular momentum vectors. So you can kind of, again, by eye, draw a circle around them and notice that it's offset from the ecliptic plane by about 10, 15 degrees, something like this. Um, now, um, back when you know, we were writing the first uh, set of papers. We didn't fully appreciate this, but uh, closer to 2019, we started to notice that in our models, um, actually, uh, Planet Nine tends to discriminate heavily based upon the orbital stability of the objects that it uh, that it clusters. And in fact, in the models, right, only objects that do not interact strongly with Neptune exhibit any orbital confinement, right? Objects that chaotically scatter off of Neptune don't show any confinement at all. And this is because in the case, uh, I mean, Planet Nine's overall gravitational field is pretty weak, right? So if you're going to cluster things through, uh, through secular dynamics, right, you want it to be, you want your objects to also not be perturbed by uh, Neptune scattering. And last year, I did quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of work together with Rosemary Mardling and David Nisvorny on trying to estimate, um, you know, where does the stability boundary lie between objects that will strongly chaotically interact with Neptune and thus will be polluted by the chaotic noise, so to speak, and those that uh, will not. So for the distant solar system, I won't go into the analysis of exactly how. We uh, derived this, but other than to say that um, it re the problem sort of reduces to uh, something called the Cherikov standard map. Um, if you're interested, I invite you to look at the paper, but this is kind of the, the expression that we get. And if we then go back to the data and examine which objects are stable and which objects are not, I think, again, you see a very clear correlation between orbital stability and the degree of clustering. And so here the purple orbits are the ones where if you were to just run an n-body simulations of this, right, they would do nothing. They would just process very slowly. Whereas the objects that are green are unstable, they would leave the solar system on some time scale of you know, a few hundreds of millions of years. And 
you know, you can do exercises about, you know, in different ways about computing the statistical significance of this if you do it correctly by taking advantage of the comparison sample of the Kuiper belt, you get a fa false alarm probability of this clustering, of this cumulative clustering, about 0.4%. But I think that the sharper question, right, really lies in the correlation with dynamical stability. There is no way to bias your observations towards stable objects, right? You know, when you're at the telescope, you don't look at the night sky and see a star and think, my, that looks like a stable Kuiper Belt object. I'm going to keep following that one up. And that one looks totally unstable, right? In fact, for the first year, you don't know anything about the orbit anyway. So I think the fact that the outer solar system now shows this rather clear correlation with orbital stability is, is pretty telling. So where does this come from? Okay. So this is a uh, one simulation of how Planet Nine shapes the outer solar system. We've got Neptune here. Um, we've got Planet Nine as this big um, pink ellipse. And this is a population of Kuiper Belt objects four and a half billion years ago when the Kuiper Belt was first created. So it starts out in a perfectly axisymmetric manner when they've just been scattered out by Neptune. This is a sort of post-Nice model instability state. And it takes a little while for this pattern to develop, but the process by which um, objects that are anti-aligned with the major axis of planet nine come into survival is actually an interplay between planet nine and Neptune. And again, it took us a while to, to actually figure out what's going on. And what's going on here is that as these objects process through, Okay. When they go through orbital alignment, they go through a peak in their eccentricity. And when their eccentricity peaks, their perihelion, my closest approach to the star, gets jammed into the orbit of Neptune. And then Neptune scatters these objects out of the solar system entirely. So it's not that Planet Nine, you know, has this gravity that's that's trying to, you know, confine everybody and tell them to all live together, you know, in a kind of a communal state in an anti-aligned configuration. It's more that just like objects that are aligned get ejected. And those that are entrained into an anti-aligned libration, their perihelion gets removed from Neptune. That's why they're stable. That's where that connection comes from within the context of this model. Okay. Now you guys are all seeing this too, right? Like you got, I'm not, you guys also agree that this is clustering? I'm not alone. I don't hear any enthusiasm. I only hear laughter, which is uh, which is concerning for me. Um, okay, so we're now almost at the end of this particular run. Uh, the final thing I'll ask you to pay attention to real quick is the fact that in all of these calculations, we produce objects that are all kind of highly inclined with respect to the plane the solar system. But look at this guy, right? That's something that's pretty robust. In fact, even Planet Nine simulations that fail to confine the orbits subsidally will produce this highly inclined um, dynamics. So uh, we thought that it would be a good prediction to predict the existence of these highly inclined, a population of highly inclined long period objects in the solar system. Um, but our prediction turned out to be a retrodiction um, because after all, as it turns out, these objects have already been discovered and they've been discovered by the WISE survey in part. And again, this is a plot that's now a little bit out of date. There's now a greater population of these kind of nearly perpendicular uh, orbits. And there's really no good way to generate them because the don't get generated self-consistently in any planet formation model. And the idea of kind of grabbing them from the Oort cloud, right? Uh, the, the flux is, is far too low to reproduce the data. So something is required to generate these highly inclined objects. And that's a pretty robust uh, outcome of the model. And the final thing that I'll hit on is if we return now back to 30 AU, um, there exists this newly found also population of objects that are pretty circular, 
but very, very highly inclined. Okay, so we initially thought that this was completely disconnected from anything Planet Nine, because after all, this is just like right there. It's it's where Pluto is. So Planet Nine's gravity plays an effectively negligible role. But if you uh, follow through the evolution that you see in the simulations, so this is again Uranus, Neptune. This is the orbit of Planet Nine. This is a particular Kuiper Belt object, which is doing its chaotic, you know, dance and doing its orbital flips, as we saw in the previous slide. Then, when it scatters off of Neptune, right, its counterpart, some of its counterparts get like, scattered out of the solar system completely. Few get scattered in. Okay, and when they scattered in, they actually get to park in this. In this Kind of highly inclined state around Neptune, uh, looking very much like the observed data. Okay, so if you liked it, then you should have put a ring on it. That's what the solar system is telling us. Um, and again, there's no like, you know, I, like I don't want to make it look like these simulations are magic, right? Like at the end of the day, what's going on in these simulations is that F equals MA, but F also equals GMM over R squared, and there are no additional ingredients. Um, so if we look at where Planet Nine populates the solar system, right, with these highly inclined bodies, there's a pretty well-described pattern in orbital inclination versus semi-major axis versus perihelion distance. And we kind of create these, uh, this background kind of green two-dimensional histogram. And this is where the data is now, okay? So these objects are, like I said, are uh, say impossible to produce in any other self-consistent way. Um, so, um, I think this is yet another uh, kind of uh, tantalizing line of evidence that points towards the existence of Planet Nine. Okay, I'll finish by showing you guys one like fun thing. So we haven't found Planet Nine yet, but my friend Eduardo Martoret, who's the conductor of the Miami Symphony, has written an awesome like twenty-minute long. Uh, Planet Nine Symphony, which which features incredible time signature changes and and various other things, and we uh, recorded this during the pandemic. Uh, so they the symphony recorded the um, you know, the song in you know, Miami. I recorded it at my house in LA, and then we used the modern. We like fused those things together and used modern technology. Uh, Microsoft Teams to connect to the space station, right? And, uh, you know, Soichi Noguchi, guy, uh, listened to it and politely said that he liked it. Uh, you know, um, the internet had other opinions. David Gertzman says that this is dripping with the usual self-importance and arrogance one can always expect from composers and musicians. But other than that, it was okay. Uh, and Smokey McPot here says that bizarre science, Planet Nine, meets pseudoscience, face veils, because I don't know if you noticed the symphony is all masked up. So this Smokey McPot is unmasked, unvaxxed, unafraid. Okay, uh, I think at this point, we're at 1140. So I'll stop here and take any questions. Thank you. Uh, so I have two, two questions. Uh, so the first one is um, for the rocket planets, yeah? For yes. The first one. So what about the solar system? You say, well, you should Yeah. Start, but... mm -hmm. Okay, so the solar system, uh, you crank up your alpha a little bit, right? So you choose a marginally more uh, turbulent disk. And the number of Earth masses that you trap in the rock ring is now down to two, two and a half. So then within the rock ring, the formation time scale is now longer or comparable to or longer than the disk. So the objects take a long time to grow. They never migrate and they get kind of sit around at one AU and you just kind of get uh, resolve back the terrestrial planets of the solar system. Simulations of forming the 
terrestrial planets out of a ring in the literature are are very common right like i don't think you know we needed to reproduce them just because they're they're so uh so prevalent so i think the the alpha really the fact that each disc will have its own you know degree of turbulence is is the link and then my second question is when uh, when you saw these you know packed systems mm -hmm. that are similar in mass actually observations look at the sizes so we know that they are similar in size but actually for those with follow-ups mm -hmm. they are not that similar in mass. yes so uh, i'm glad you brought this up because not only do the observations uh you know the the kind of peas in the pod papers talk about the radius they actually talk about the log of radius uh, so the only thing that can be more self-similar than the log of radius is the log of the log of radius um right but you're absolutely right the radii are extraordinarily uniform the masses uh, are uniform at the level of about a half so the dispersion divided by the mean in the data is about 0 0.5 and that's what we see as well so that's about a factor of two more uniform than the terrestrial planets right if you ask how, how uniform are the terrestrial planets it's on the dispersion is on the order of the of the mass the exoplanets are more uniform than that but the mass uniformity is also there you're but you're absolutely right it's far less than the radius right that's expected but, but we we compare um, we compare not with the radius we compare with the data that gives us the mass dispersion so, so the superlative with the key feature in your model is the fact that you this and yes so in principle I mean, the answer to these frameworks, I mean, it's, it's, it's nice because it's easy, but you could, you know, come up with a completely different sure. physical mechanism that sets up your, your ring and instability, you know, gas gas instability, any kind of inevitable. Absolutely. In fact, you could invoke a large scale pressure bump because of some zonal flow, whatever. Um, you know, this night, I think the kind of story of it decreting nicely also connects with the work we did on the Galilean satellites you know and, and circumplanetary disks are of course decretion disks so because uh, they're vertically fed from the gap so so I think it all kind of there's a nice coherent story there but you're absolutely right the two things can be divorced and the model can will still work absolutely yeah yes yeah yeah absolutely so i have no uh like i said i i think it's it's an um you know it's something that is arguably a very simple way to make a ring because vapor flows out and dust flows in and so like you can you know create a, a very kind of robust kind of attractor that way but it doesn't have to be this yeah i was wondering about the efficiency of this information so how much of the bug uh, as I mess, for example, is trapped in this type of scenario. Do you have enough stuff to create, like, to compensate the data so that you can? Yeah, okay, great question. So, um, we do not always create the rock ring because you can choose an alpha, they can choose a reasonable alpha that will actually just, you know, the diffusion in the rock ring will be too high and you will make no terrestrial planets, right? So, maybe that's okay because only 50 percent of stars have these objects so you may maybe should allow for a fraction of them to not create objects but we always create the ice ring right this the proper ice line is very good at this mechanism and there it's less dependent on alpha and you kind of tend to create for solar metallicity tend to create 20 to between 20 and sort of 100 earth masses of material so absolutely, you create enough mass for the comets. But I should say that this picture must be incomplete. Maybe because we know in the solar system, there are also planetesimals, like carbonaceous objects that formed late, later than this stage. Okay, So there must exist also another mechanism that creates the planetesimal ring that drives Neptune migration. Okay? And I think that's unrelated entirely to this like ice line thing. I mean, one idea that's fun to throw around is that can be kind of the last 
um, stage of planetesimal formation, as the nebula is evaporating from the inside out, your local gas to dust ratio goes to towards zero and cr kind of triggers uh, gravitational collapse of dust as you move out. So that's one idea for late stage formation. But uh, I wanted to throw that out there that this model only really concerns the first, you know, generation of planetesimals. And we know that's not all there was. Like my question was just to understand better this thing. So you show the simulation where planetesimals are coming together and making this terrestrial core. Mm -hmm. So in your opinion, can we like reproduce the solar system terrestrial planet just by hyperdealing the parameters or is it a combination of uh, other mechanisms also? It's mostly, I would argue that it's it's mostly the same process, but operating at a lower total mass budget. Okay, so the solar system is an, uh, not a total end member of the scenario where the mass, mass budget is zero, but it's small compared to what the typical star does. And the typical star is, I guess the implication here would be that our, our disk was somewhat more turbulent uh, than, the, than the average disk. That, to me, is not a uh not a problem our disk was unusual also in that it made the giant planets right so the, the solar system is kind of uh you know like we should enjoy the solar system while it lasts okay it's not going to be here forever and we should definitely yeah so i think that that's why no no i certainly not within the framework of this model yeah So yeah. Yeah, there are lonely ones uh, out there, and um, I'm glad you're asking this because, in fact, uh, you know, the, this model stops at three million years, right? And post three million years, we think that um, the vast majority of systems go unstable, right? So they get kind of, you know built up into a configuration that's overly compact, that's being artificially kept stable by the dissipation of the disk, uh, the dissipative nature of the disk. Now, once you remove the disk, there are many, many different mechanisms that will trigger instabilities. During this time, you can, A, excite the inclination dispersion so that all you see is one planet, or, uh, you know, in fact, in some cases, you'd really do coalesce uh, all this stuff into a single object because it's so deep in the potential well that nothing scatters out, right? So it all kind of will keep having, you know, spaghetti orbits until uh, it, it collides. So that's that's a possibility. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. Oh, thank you, Sure. Yeah. So, I heard that the uh, technique talked about the uh,